our scripture reading today. For those of you who have your Bibles, please open with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 2. We know this story very well. I'm reading from the NIV, only because that was the version I grew up with. John chapter 8, starting from verse 2. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, sorry, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? I'm sure that most of you are familiar with Philip Yancey's best-selling book, What's So Amazing About Grace. In that book, Philip opens telling the story of a prostitute in the slums of Chicago. It was a friend of Yancey's who had met this woman and this woman was so desperate for drug money that she was actually hiring out her baby daughter in order to obtain funds for her substance abuse. Now, Yancey's friend said to this woman, have you ever thought of going to a church for help? Here's her response. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They'd just make me feel worse. So why, why is this story so tragic? Well, for many reasons. The drug abuse, the lifestyle, the horror of that innocent child being trapped through no fault of its own. I'd like to suggest this story is tragic for more reasons. For me as a Christian, this woman should have been able to go to a church. We know in our hearts that this woman should have been able to come to us. You know, the devil has often succeeded in distorting the image of God in God's own followers. And I'm sure you'd agree that the devil tries harder with us. We profess to be God's followers. The devil tries even harder to distort God's holy image in us in our daily lives. We know the worldwide Christian church. We only have to turn on the news. And I find myself hanging my head in shame when I hear yet another report of abuse, physical, political abuse, and yes, spiritual abuse at the hands of the so-called Christian church. Christian in name, but not necessarily in action. But to return to our scripture reading, we can see from John chapter 8 that the Pharisees, the devil certainly succeeded with the Pharisees in distorting what should have been God's image in his religious leaders. The desire of ages tells us that if only the Pharisees could have set aside their petty prejudices, they would have been able to compare written prophecies with the very life of Jesus they saw unfolding in front of them. They would have put two and two together and would have known he was the Messiah. They then would have been in the position to lead Israel to Jesus' spiritual kingdom. Sadly, we know that the very opposite happened. We read in John, chapter, John 8, verse 6, they were trying to trap him, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus into saying something they could use against him. Now, we are familiar with the story and we're familiar with the bind that Jesus was supposedly being trapped into. If Jesus, on one hand, let the woman go unpunished, he could have been accused of breaking the laws of Moses. If, on the other hand, Jesus agreed and said, yes, this woman is worthy of the death penalty, then the Pharisees could have run straight to the Roman authorities and accused Jesus of usurping their authority. However, we can see that the Pharisees' case against Jesus was flawed from the start. In verse 4 of chapter 8, the Pharisees claimed... Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Have you ever thought, where was the guy? 
Where was the bloke? Takes two to tango. Where was he? The Pharisees had brought in just the woman. Let's see what Moses' law actually says about this. Leviticus 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife and the wife of his, or sorry, with the wife of his neighbour, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Likewise, Deuteronomy 22:22. 22, 22. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. So we see here in this story the Pharisees only bringing 50% of Moses' stipulations, the adulteress, not the adulterer. So the Pharisees, in trying to trap Jesus, were already dishonouring the very laws they were professing to uphold. Furthermore, we see Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17, the Pharisees invoked Moses' law regarding witnesses. Now, in this case, they were correct. Deuteronomy 17 says, On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person is to be put to death, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting that person to death, and then the hands of all of the people. You must purge the evil from among you. So the Pharisees got that bit right. They were certainly bringing plenty of witnesses against the act. But Jesus, of course, was well aware of this kangaroo court. How did Jesus deal with the witnesses? Let's read it once again from the spirit of prophecy, Desire of Ages. Well he knew for what purpose this case had been brought before him. He read the heart and knew the character and life history of everyone in his presence. These would-be guardians of justice had themselves led their victim into sin that they might lay a snare for Jesus. Giving no sign that he had heard their question, he stooped and fixing his eyes upon the ground began to write in the dust. Impatient at his delay and apparent indifference, the accusers drew nearer, urging the matter upon his attention. But as their eyes, following those of Jesus, fell upon the pavement at his feet, their countenances changed. There, traced before them, were the guilty secrets of their own lives. Can we just stop there a minute and ask the question and consider we're not that different from the Pharisees, are we? We want to be, we try to be, we pray to be, we read our lesson study to be, we come to church to be different from the Pharisees. But if, if like myself, you look in your heart, you think there's a bit of a resonance there, there's a bit of that attitude that lingers despite all my prayers and all my Bible study to the contrary. I feel that deep inside we know our Christian walk isn't quite on the par that Jesus would have it to be. And it's not our outward actions, it's the inward that Jesus keeps drawing us back to. Claire, do you have a pharisaical attitude? And if you do, what are you going to do about it? Sometimes we check out the sins of others, we may highlight the sins of others, we may enjoy reading about the sins of others in any old glossy magazine at the hairdressers. We may not be trying to um, publicly trap Jesus. We may be just trying to make ourselves look a little better. There is a book called The Sweet Smell of Failure. Very liberating title, The Sweet Smell of Failure. And the author, Joseph Epstein, asks, why do we enjoy watching people fall from grace? In fact, why do we especially enjoy the rich, the powerful, the famous? We like watching them especially in their falls from grace. These are his words, Joseph Epstein. How delightful to those of us living out our modest lives to witness, if only through the media, such ego-filled balloons getting popped. When we see someone mightier than we, divested of his dignity, stripped of his pretensions, humiliated in public, we feel comforted by having retained our own dignity 
pretension's good name. Perhaps, after all, we conclude, it is just as well that we are not so rich, powerful, beautiful, talented. Relishing in others' humiliations is good for our ego. Even when we know deep down that if our local newspaper knew everything about us, we might be on the cover too. I'd like to share a story with you about how an actual judge, he was a judge for his profession, how he turned his job as judging into a tool for Christ's kingdom. The man's name is Paul Herbert, and he is a municipal court judge from Ohio. One night, his daughters asked him, Daddy, what's your purpose in life? And he just shrugged off the answer, oh, you know, honey, be a light on the bench. But that got him thinking. Got him thinking, and that night he prayed to God. God, can you show me some way that I could be significant for you in my work? So about nine months later, after seeing a typical procession of domestic violence victims, the sheriff brought a prostitute into Herbert's courtroom. Herbert realized that she looked exactly like one of the domestic violence victims that he'd been seeing. It messed with his categories. Herbert began researching the criminology of prostitution and what he learned stunned him. Around 87% of prostitutes are sexually abused, typically starting at around the age of eight. They often start using drugs to deal with that trauma around the age of 12. The girls then run away from home or foster care and they're dragged by predatory pimps into the commercial sex trade. What was Herbert going to do about it? He decided to apply his faith to his work. He launched a new program called Catch Court. That's C-A-T-C-H, an acronym, Catch Court, which stands for Changing Attitudes to Change Habits. So through this program, prostitute, well, sorry, prior to this program, prostitutes just cycled in and out of jail, in and out of court, not changing anything. But through Herbert's two-year program, women convicted of prostitution, they receive drug treatment, counseling, their movements are monitored electronically, they offer support to each other, and they appear weekly before Judge Herbert to account for their progress. So Herbert describes some of these women who have come through the program. One woman was sold when she was a little girl. She was sold by her mother to older men for crack co cocaine. Today, she's a student at Columbus State Community College. Another woman, she was kidnapped by a motorcycle gang and raped, transported to other gangs and sold for sex. Now, after the program, she is two years sober from heroin. Interestingly, Herbert also emphasizes his own spiritual transformation as he was conducting this program. In his words, he says, the Holy Spirit continues to reveal how much I've been forgiven and how similar I am to the individuals that come before me. That's really hard to say. My job is to judge, but the farther I go along in my faith, the more I realize that I'm just like most of them. And that makes me more understanding, more kind, more merciful. So, back to our Pharisees. Jesus has just laid bare their guilty secrets in the sand at his feet. Jesus referenced Moses' instruction by saying, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he went back and wrote some more in the ground. The response by the Pharisees. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. May I add that there is a proviso to this ending. There is a little caveat. Perhaps you have heard this ending being quoted as a way for people to minimize sin, to downplay sin, to excuse sin. 
perhaps you've been in conversation with people and comments have been made along the lines of, well, Jesus didn't condemn the woman, so Christians shouldn't call any behaviour sin. Jesus didn't condemn the woman, so Christians shouldn't comment on lifestyle choices. Christians shouldn't be so narrow-minded because Jesus didn't condemn. But can we just have a look at the Greek word behind the translated English word condemn? So the Greek word is katakrino. And katakrino is actually a legal term. So Jesus was commenting about passing a legal judgment. Katakrino can mean to give judgment against or to issue a penalty or to judge as worthy of a punishment. So what was Jesus really saying in other words when in our English translation we say, neither do I condemn you? In other words, Jesus was suggesting, then neither do I sentence you to death under the law, or then neither do I issue you a penalty, or then neither do I claim that you are worthy of punishment. So this is not the same as agreeing with the behaviour or glossing over the behaviour. He was clearing her of the legal ramifications of what she had done. So, while secular minds may approve of Jesus' words, neither do I condemn you, his final words, leave your life of sin, they're not quite as popular. In fact, we as Christians in our pluralistic, secular, postmodern society, we do have to be very careful how, when, if ever we explicitly ask our non-church friends to leave a life of sin. I'd like to tell you another story which I hope will inspire your own Christ-like solution to our pluralistic, secular conundrum. We want to encourage people to leave their lives of sin, but we want to do it in Jesus' way. This story... The lady's name is Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. At the time of writing, her age was 36, and she was a recently tenured professor at the Centre for Women's Study at Syracuse University. Now, Rosaria and her lesbian partner, they were members of a Unitarian Universalist church. I hadn't heard of this church prior to reading this story, but apparently um, the theology is varied in a Unitarian Universalist church. They actually um, absorb multiple beliefs and spiritual practices from all world religions and multiple world views. So world views including humanism, atheism, agnosticism, pantheism, deism, neo-paganism. They take what they like from these and under the banner of Unitarian Universalism. So at this particular church, Rosaria was the coordinator of what was called the Welcoming Committee, which was the gay and lesbian advocacy group. So up to this point in her life, Rosaria said in her words that the only Christians she knew were intellectually impaired. The only Christians she knew were the type that turned up at gay pride rallies with hate slogans, that sent her hate emails at her work. They would hold up banners, gay is going to hell, God hates fags, hateful, unchristian language. So this was the image that Rosaria had of Christians. That image would gradually change after Rosaria met a local pastor. The pastor's name was Ken and his wife's name was Floy. I don't know how they met, but this encounter encouraged Rosaria to eventually give her life to Christ. What I'd like to read to you is Rosaria's account of the first meeting with this pastor and his wife. I remember being conscious of my butch haircut and the gay and pro-choice bumper stickers on my car. I remember awkwardly greeting my hosts at the door and pulling out of my bag two gifts, a bottle of good red wine and a box of strong tea. I wanted to know these people, but not at the expense of compromising my moral standards. My lesbian identity and culture and its values mattered a lot to me. I came to my culture and its values through life experience, but also through much research and deep thinking. I liked Pastor Ken and Floyd immediately 
because they seemed sensitive to that. During our meal, I remember holding my breath and waiting to be punched in the stomach with something grossly offensive. I believed at this time that God was dead and that if he ever was alive, the fact of poverty, violence, racism, sexism, homophobia and war was proof that he didn't care about his creation. I believed that religion was, as Marx wrote, the opiate of the masses. But Ken's God seemed alive, three-dimensional and wise, if firm. And Ken and Floyd were anything but intellectually impaired. Ken and Floyd did something at the meal that has a long Christian history. They invited the stranger in, not to scapegoat me, but to listen and to learn and to dialogue. We didn't debate worldview. They were willing to walk the long journey to me in Christian compassion. During our meal, they did not share the gospel with me. After our meal, they did not invite me to church. Because of these glaring omissions to the Christian script as I had come to know it, when the evening ended and Pastor Ken said he wanted to stay in touch, I knew that it was truly safe to accept his open hand. Since this beginning, the journey on which the Lord has taken me has been a great adventure. And this simple meal in a pastor's home was the first leg of my journey. Before I ever stepped foot in a church, I spent two years meeting with Ken and Floy, on and off studying scripture and my heart. Ken knew at the time that I couldn't come to church. It would have been too threatening, too weird, too much. So, Ken was willing to bring the church to me. So I ask us all this morning, what's stopping us? What's preventing us from acting more Christ-like instead of more pharisaical. There's one Christian counselor, David Siemens. After years of counseling, he came to two conclusions. Two major causes, in his opinion, of most emotional problems among evangelical Christians. He writes, number one, it's the failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness. Number two, our failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace to other people. We read, we hear, we believe a good theology of grace, but that's not the way we live. The good news of the gospel of grace has not penetrated the level of our emotions. So when I look at myself and I allow the good news of the gospel of grace to penetrate my emotions, that should enable me to be more understanding, more merciful, more kind. And when we as a church allow the good news of the gospel of grace to infiltrate everything we do, our hearts, our minds, our emotions, our activities, a desperate, homeless, drug-abusing prostitute should be able to know that asking our church for help would make her feel better not worse. God bless you this morning.